Well, welcome everyone. Um, I'm just giving some very brief instructions to help you out. My name is Bill Hobbicht. I'm one of the two pastors here at DCC. Um, so just the housekeeping, there are water fountains right out that down that hallway right over there to your right as well as restrooms. So if you're looking for those, just head down that hallway and you should be set. I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to the lead on this, which is Christina Blackman. Great. Thank you, Bill. And thank you for hosting us here at your facility. We appreciate it. Martha, come on in. I'm just going to quickly uh, introduce our panel and then we'll get started right away. Each will have a few minutes to talk about what they're doing in the space and then we'll open it up to questions. So uh, to the far left or my left is uh, Mayor Rob Davis. Next to him is Chief Pytel, Darren Pytel. Uh, from Yolo County, we have Tracy Dickinson. She's the Homeless Program Coordinator, although I think her title slightly is different now. Um, our guest, Martha Teeter, from, she's working with the Pathways Program, the Employment Pathways Program, and she'll tell you more about that. And Bill Pride from Davis Community Mill. So I'll turn it over to Rob. Okay. Well, thanks for coming. Um, we, um, we appreciate the opportunity to have a community dialogue and discussion Q&A on this topic. Um, I think... You know, in my 25 years in, in maternal and child health uh, in, in Africa, um, where we worked with, with extreme poverty and exclusion, we, we would often talk, uh, and actually there's a literature on the whole concept of the final mile. The final mile, reaching the final mile down that road where people are the poorest, where health conditions are the worst, that's the costliest. It's very costly to go the final mile. In fact, you may pay as much in the final mile than you paid in every mile up to the final mile combined because that's the intractable place, that's the place of deep need, and it's also the place that's hardest to reach. And I think as we talk about, I think the reason, you know, the homelessness that we're here to talk about today, really the homelessness that we're here to talk about is really the final mile homelessness. We're talking about a syndrome, really, that, that, uh, d that, that shows itself as, uh, as homelessness, as people living uh, in camps, uh, it's a syndrome. It's, it's a combination of many factors that would include uh, uh, some mental health challenges, often, frequently, uh, some very deep addictions uh, to some very, very difficult substances, and then probably, as we're learning more and more, most likely some really severe childhood trauma that uh, sort of underlies everything that's happened since. And so, we have a final mile problem. I think if we look at the vast majority of homelessness, the issue of homelessness, the vast majority in this community, you don't know anything about. Because the vast majority are people who are maybe coming out of jail and needing a, a, a temporary residence and then get reintegrated. Or they're someone who's lost a job in a house and rapid rehousing helps them. Or they're school kids whose parents are couch surfing. And we don't even hear about them oftentimes. Or there's a, there's a woman fleeing domestic violence who finds help in a, in a local shelter and then moves into the next part of her life and her children's life. Those, that homelessness, I would, I would wager most of us don't know anything about because it's not visible. It's not something we see and most of the agencies that are working on it in this community do so in a quiet and consistent way and help people in ways that never become apparent to the broader population. What we're talking about, I think, based on the emails that I get, is the, is the final mile, the last mile homelessness. Um, and as I said, it's, it's a syndrome, and I think we need to keep that in mind. What we're seeing when we see people um, choosing to live outside in, in camps that are uh, evidently and obviously substandard for, for human uh, living is, is a combination of factors that, um, that we maybe only understand in part and certainly do not fully grasp in terms of their, uh, the way they uh, uh, enchain and enslave people. I know many people are saying, why don't we do more uh, bringing the tools of the, uh, you know, of prosecution? We should be, you know, we need to be moving these people out. What they're doing is illegal. Uh, what they're doing is, is detrimental to the community. Uh, and they need to be prosecuted for that. And I think, you know, Darren will probably talk more about that. But I, I can tell you, having talked to the DA, I mean, I think we're, many of us are at a place of saying, really, I mean, we're going to cycle people through the criminal justice system one more time. Uh, we arrest them. We incarcerate them. We find them. We put them back out on the street. They don't pay the fines. They break probation. And the cycle continues. Somewhere along the line, that's not, in my view, a, a solution. 
Uh, this certainly isn't dealing with the underlying causes that lead to the behavior that we want to address. And so I think we need to talk about that underlying behavior because uh, cycling people through the criminal justice uh, system may move them out of sight and mind for a time, but uh, is really not um, moving us forward in, in terms of dealing with the real issues that people are facing. Um, I think we're committed as a city, we're definitely committed as a city and I think as a county to move forward in, in a process known as Housing First, which is about uh, helping people who are in those situations before we do anything in terms of service delivery to first and foremost move them into housing, get them a roof over their head and then provide wraparound services. But, but let's be clear, that's not a panacea. To say we're committed to that does not make it happen. First and foremost, we live in California. And so housing, in case you haven't noticed, is at a premium in every community. Uh, we do not have currently the beds that we need to house. We do not have beds at the price that's affordable for people even with vouchers to house. And so this council and the prior one has set aside resources to build out uh, 30 new units. Uh, we, are, uh, we already have uh, several dozen in the city. We're looking at a voucher program that we can talk about more. But the idea is moving people into housing, and that's where the challenge begins. Because once the roof is there, and that's already a challenge, then the wraparound services that, that really are about addressing the underlying needs of the population in, in, in question become important. And lest we think that those are short-term wraparound programs, I think we need to remember that we're dealing with people that have gone down a long road and it's gonna be an equally long road to come back. And so the services will need to be continued over a long period of time, which implies a revenue stream that we need to create within the community to pay for that. This will not be dealt with through one-off grants over short periods of time. We need to find out how to generate streams of revenue if we're really gonna attack the, the challenge that we have. And so uh, ultimately, I hope in our conversation, we need to talk about resources we need to talk about resources. Um, and so I hope we'll get back to that. I look forward to um, engaging. I have a, a, a fact sheet that um, uh, our, one of our consultants, uh, Joan Plin, also put together. It's on the table over there. You can pick it up as you go out. I, I may refer to it, but also hope that we'll have an opportunity for good uh, uh, exchange on, on the true nature of the problem that I think the community is concerned about. Thank you for coming today. Um, just as the mayor said, uh, we are also, as the police, faced with challenges with the homeless community. And we, I think we're kind of the, the first uh, stop for most people to talk about how homeless are affecting some of the, the areas in town, downtown, some of the neighborhoods, and uh, everything from where homeless are living or where they're hanging out during the daytime and the effect that it has on, on quality of life. So we've had to... Uh, kind of deal with that and and it's very difficult to deal with so kind of this the starting place is um, we get a lot of emails and and a lot of letters saying that uh, why aren't we doing something with the homeless and you know they're where they're living is a crime uh, they're illegally camping or you know not in an area where they're supposed to be they're trespassing and uh, you know committing criminal violations and and that's actually probably the number one complaint that we get and the answer is really complicated. So the, the first thing that we have to remember is that being homeless in itself is not a crime. And until we have housing for every single human being in, in this country, um, we can't criminalize just being homeless. A person is able to you know, sit down somewhere and they're able to go to bed somewhere. And if we don't have housing for them, then the real challenge is, is where are they going to do that? So that's the starting place for how we have to work um, with the, the homeless population. So, you know, for example, if, if a homeless person has no other choice and, and the only choice is to lay down a sleeping bag in uh, one of the parks, um, that may be the best place that we have for them for that period of time until we can, you know, find some more uh, either temporary or permanent solution. So there's, there's particular times when, uh, even though it may be a technical violation of a local ordinance or law, uh, the overriding principle that we have to operate under is the United States Constitution, and specifically the 14th Amendment Due Process Clause, which says that uh, just because somebody's committing a crime, you have to take a look at why they're committing it and determine whether the, the statute is really addressing the, the underlying problem. Just as the mayor said, what we're really seeing in the population is a, a lot of uh, mental illness and extreme addiction in some cases. 
the uh, the overall criminal justice system has changed very rapidly in the last five six years, uh, starting with um, AB 109 and then uh, Prop 47, um, and each of these has had kind of an impact on some of the the crime or nuisance behavior that that people are talking about or concerned about. We get a lot of emails. Uh, you know, drugs are going on in the in the homeless population. The the camps are full of people using drugs. Why aren't the police doing anything about it? Well, part of that is, and the mayor kind of hit it on the head, uh, you can only arrest somebody so many times before you realize that that is not the best way to deal with the situation. Under Prop 47, uh, offenses that used to be felonies are now misdemeanors. They don't result in jail time, nor is there any uh, incentive or part of the, the process that actually helps people get um, through the addiction problems and deals with mental health. Those are all systems that we're trying to improve, and and uh, hopefully working with the, the district attorney, we're finding uh, different ways to deal with those difficult circumstances. So there's been some legislative changes that have, have really kind of compounded that problem. Um, I think where we're the police, where we're transitioning, I just presented a, a, a strategic plan last night to the city council. A, an important component of the strategic plan is to, to deal with homeless services. Uh, traditionally, we've always looked to the to Yellow County to provide you know true help to those in need, whether it's uh, mental illness or addiction um, or dealing with housing. And I think what's become crystal clear is the county has been cut and cut and cut. And every person that I talk to uh, at the at Yellow County says the same thing. Yep, we used to do that. We don't anymore. We can't afford it. And I think really what we're recommending to, to council and the city manager's office is that uh, we start doing some of these things within the city of Davis, uh, functions that were traditionally left with the county. Um, we probably need to get involved in them if we're going to uh, solve some of our, our local issues. Um, so uh, what, we're, what we're proposing is putting together a, a team to go out and work specifically with the homeless, including having our own social worker, um, and dedicated staff to dealing with some of the camps and cleanups and relocation uh, when necessary, family reunification, uh, addiction, mental health services. So really having a team of specially trained and specifically assigned personnel to kind of deal with all of the issues uh, and, and you know, help uh, uh, you know, do case management and hopefully get them into either housing or programs that may help their particular need. So uh, just as the mayor said, uh, really open to, uh, to questions as we get there and uh, having dialogue about some of these. Hi everyone, thanks so much for being here. Uh, my name is Tracy Dickinson. I am the uh, homeless coordinator with the County Health and Human Services Agency. Uh, I was appointed to, to this role in August of 2015, so about a year and a half ago. And um, before that, I was working in the county administrator's office doing a lot of analysis on this issue. So I have some, some history here in YOLO um, for several years. Um, so I want to talk a little bit about my role. Um, I'm not a direct service provider. Right? So I don't, I'm not on the one that's on the streets providing services to, to people experiencing homelessness in our communities. Um, I really function more at a, at a systems coordination level, and so a lot of that what I do is work with our partners, and we have a lot of them, including our residents and our, and our businesses, to talk about what's working in the system that cares for people experiencing homelessness and what's not working, and how we can, can you know, fill some of those gaps and address some of the issues that are happening, um, and kind of help the, move the collaborations along to do that. Um, but that being said, the county as a whole is a, is a huge service provider. Um, I'm not an expert on, on the majority of our programs, but I know something about all of them, and I can certainly get you to somebody who is an expert if you have questions about a specific program. But I, I wanted to just highlight a few of the programs that the Health and Human Services Agency does offer that um, people experiencing homelessness might, uh, you know, benefit from. So we have some public health uh, programs and specifically around offering immunizations at low or no cost and things like that. Um, we are the holder of um, 
issuing public benefits. So you're t when I, I'm talking about uh, CalFresh or food stamps, um, CalWORKs, uh, Medi-Cal, general assistance, and, and, and things of that nature. So when folks um, need a little help, that's that's something that we, we assist with. Um, we are also the holder of a lot of the mental health services and substance use disorder treatment services for the county. Um, and so whether it's us internally offering them or contracting out services, that's something that we do a lot of coordination around as well. Um, we do, we do have a lot of direct homeless services that we fund as a county. Most of them are not internally offered by county staff. So a lot of them are offered through county contracts with nonprofit organizations. Um, so, you know, some of our providers who, we have a few of them sitting here, um, are, are really the experts on the, the how we provide the services part of it. Um, I'm gonna pass off to Martha. <laughs> this is probably for the video, not for the audience, but anyway, any rate, I'm Martha Teeter, and I'm the board president for a new nonprofit called Davis Opportunity Village. I'm sort of, I sort of here in a number of capacities. That's the first one. The second one is that I'm on the advisory board of a program that just launched Pathways to Employment. I'll mention a little bit about it. And the third is that I'm a, sort of a representative of ongoing faith organizations, concerns, and, and um, coming from that viewpoint. So the first is uh, Davis Opportunity Village. And uh, we're a, a fairly recent nonprofit as of December, but we've been going for quite a while. And uh, we're Dove for short, and the idea is that it takes a village. You'll see the little handout I have with uh, the uh, Dove coming out of the house. And our purpose is threefold, to advocate for services, to when we see services not happening, trying to make that work, building micro-housing, uh, particularly village micro-housing, so very small size housing individual units, and also about education uh, about homeless individuals to enable compassion and healing um, or wellness to occur. And many people who have been through the system many, many times. Um, I want to give you some hope that there is wellness possible for every single person who's gone through the system. The um, consequences of homelessness is that lifespans reduce 20 to 25 years, also from severe mental illness and disability and substance abuse. So there's a real, um, a real equity and health concern. Our Davis Opportunity Village is both interfaith and a community group. Um, the second uh, capacity. I'm here as the advisory board for Pathways to Employment, which just launched. And the idea is to create some jobs for homeless individuals um, that are downtown, visible. Uh, and this program is just launched a few weeks ago. Um, actually, I think just this week we're on the ground. Um, to build self-esteem uh, could be a, a fairly small job at first, but then uh, through a period, there's several stages where you might be employed. Uh, we're paying $12 an hour. We, we're fortunate enough to get some funding for this. Um, five individuals, three times a week. And uh, in the first phase, we're working at this lower phase, and then there may be ways to move through the program, maybe to build supervisory capacity for some people who are working, um, and then uh, to progress to permanent jobs that might be available within the community. So we really want to work with the business community to create some opportunities for employment as well. And the third is uh, the faith community itself. Many different faiths offer, offer meal opportunities during the week and some chances to get to services. Davis Opportunity Village, I'm sorry, uh, Davis Community Church offers a um, Friday faith and food where there's a chance uh, not only to sustain yourself with more nutritious food, um, 
but also to sit down and talk and to be listened to and to have a compassionate ear. Um, I would close by saying that the problems in our world are so difficult that we absolutely need everybody at the table. We need diversity of race. I don't see much diversity here, but hopefully there's people with ears to hear this who will um, hear the call. But we need diversity of race, diversity of socioeconomic status. We need people who've been there, who've been homeless, to come and work on these difficult problems. We need people who've been traumatized, particularly the hardest kind of trauma, which is the most common with young children, with, in, in homeless individuals, is uh, trauma as young children. And that is, a, it has a different way to address it. People who abuse with substances are, are trying to heal the pain and the trauma that they carry around with them in their bodies every day. And we need these people at the table too. So um, I hope we can together develop some programs. And it's gonna take, as Rob said, another revenue stream, and that may be also community contributions because one of the wonderful things about Davis is we live in a community where a lot of people help. We've already seen that in many organizations and interfaith rotating winter shelter. So I invite you to continue this dialogue. Good morning. My name is Bill Pride. I'm the director of Davis Community Meals and Housing. And I've been involved with Davis Community Meals and Housing for the last 24 years. I've been the director there for the last 16. And I'm going to kind of give you a little overview of what we do in the community and probably mention a few uh, other service providers in Davis who contribute to working with homeless or low-income folks. Uh, like our name implies, we started a meal program back in 1991, which we do at St. Martin's, and we have meals there right now three times a week on Tuesday, Thursday, and Saturday. And we generally serve between about 140 to about 175 different folks every week at our meals program. Uh, we have, in the last several years, we've worked closely with Interfaith Rotating Winter Shelter, and have collaborated with them to run their operations, excuse me, <coughs> to run their operations at the local churches uh, provided by providing trained staff and working with some of the issues they deal with uh, with the homeless population that stays at the shelter on a nightly basis. Uh, for the last 20 or so years, we've had a transitional housing program at 1111 H Street, and that program houses up to 16 homeless individuals, 12 men, four women, and they can stay with us for up to 18 months, and our staff works with everybody involved in the program to get the services they need, whether it's for mental health, whether it's for substance abuse, uh, whether it's life skills training, whether it's getting counseling or getting jobs. It's pretty much almost anything you can imagine we help folks with uh, on a, year -round, a yearly basis. Uh, we also have a program housing homeless families in Davis. We generally house five families at a time at a small, low-income apartment community in South Davis. And again, they stay with us for up to 18 months. And we again give them a whole range of services to help them move out and move into permanent housing and to successfully transition out of being homeless. Most of the families who come to us, almost 40 to 50% are domestic violence victims who are left homeless because of uh, what occurred when their domestic violence problems. Uh, others come to us from various sources, but it's, it's a program where generally throughout a year we serve about 12 to 14 families, and out of that about 80% of those graduate into uh, permanent housing. Uh, last year, about a little over a year ago, we started the what's called a New Pathways program, which is considered a bridge or a transitional housing program, and that's a, what we call a low barrier model, which is, means that Folks stay in the program. There, many of these folks have chronic substance abuse issues, major mental health problems, and they can stay in the program whether they're using or not using. And we try to work with them and get them housing vouchers towards the end of the program to move into uh, housing. Uh, during the time with us, they get what's called wraparound services to help them deal with whatever issues they came into came into the program with. And hopefully at the end of six months to a year, we can find them some housing and move them out successfully into some place where they can get supportive services also. As Martha mentioned, we started the new Pathways program, the Pathways to Employment program earlier this year. 
Uh, we've been up and running about three weeks at this point in time, and we've started folks getting on the ground. It's a employment program to help folks who are somewhat some in our programs currently, but also others who are going to be homeless on the streets of Davis, find a productive way to make, make, make a living, uh, become productive in the community again, get a regular job, appear at employment regularly, and hopefully make connections over the next time with us, usually about four to six months they'll be with us to find some kind of permanent employment in the community. Um, the last two programs we have are basically type of outreach programs, which is our resource center, which operates at 1111 8th Street Monday to Friday from 8 in the morning to 4 in the afternoon. And we generally attract between about 75 to 90 folks there most every day. They come to us, many of are homeless, but not all. Uh, we provide almost any service you can imagine there. I mean, sometimes it's as easy as yesterday. I know there's a gentleman who came who needed a uh, ID to get back to the train or a bus to go back to his home in Minnesota. And, you know, we helped him get, do the forms and go to DMV and get a duplicate ID card, which he did not have, so he can get on the bus or get on the train. Uh, we also help folks who are behind their rent, behind in their utility bills, help get food. It's a place people can come to and get a whole range of services that they may not be able to get in the community elsewhere. Uh, we also have a street outreach program where some of our staff go out two to three times a week and work directly with the homeless in the streets of Davis to get them the services and referrals to services so hopefully they will take advantage of the local resources through the county and through other, co other community organizations to kind of get up to help they need to deal with the substance abuse or major, major mental health problems. Um, the last couple of things I would mention is that there is another organization, I don't think they're here today, but STAKE, which does a lot of work in the community for uh, homeless and low-income folks through food and also uh, address the success and other types of programs. And they're the ones who have the money to help pay people their rent if they're getting evicted or if the, the utilities are getting ready to be shut off. And the last big provider in, in Davis is Empower YOLO, which has two programs in Davis. They have their domestic violence shelter located in Davis and has been here for the last, I think, at least 20 years. And they also run the Family Resource Center, which is next door here at the corner of 5th and D Street, which deals sometimes with homeless folks, a lot of times with low-income families, finding them resources and everything else they need. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. So just to give you some background, again, I'm Christina Blackman. I'm the CEO of the Davis Chamber of Commerce. Um, why we brought this forum together, we did two last year. Some of you may have attended. Um, but we get lots of people coming into the chamber, and they're asking questions, um, complaining about some of the issues that are happening. That is both from business and from residents. And we also get a lot of individuals from the population that come in looking for services. So we try to refer them the best we can. What we do know is what we need to have an open dialogue with the community about some of the issues that are that are currently occurring and come up with some positive solutions. And that's why you're here. And thank you so much for coming. We're gonna turn it over to questions. We wanted to leave most of the time for questions. Um, so if you have a question, we have a few in advance to get this started, but um, we'll throw it to the audience right away. Um, if there is somebody, it looks like we have, Dan has a question. Um, and if you can just let us know which individual um, so they can address the question or if it's to the panel, um, we'll try to get through as many questions as we can. If we run out of time and you have a question, I suspect a few of these folks may be able to stay. If that is not the case, please seek out a chamber staff member. We'll write the question down, give us your contact information, we'll get it answered for you. Okay. So um, Sammy's gonna come around with the uh, microphone and we'll get started, thank you. Good morning, my name is Dan Carson. Um, when I worked for the LAO in Sacramento, uh, I ran our health section for some time and uh, one of the big possibilities coming out of Obamacare was healthcare for single adults who were hard to qualify before unless you could show they were disabled. And therefore, you could not only get them health care, but that would open the gates to mental health care and substance abuse treatment, which is not to say that everyone that's homeless fits in that category, but obviously a number do. Um, have, have, for either Bill or Tracy, have you been able to tap into that 
as a revenue stream to help pay for those services? Or has it turned out, as sometimes is the case in life, that it was more complicated than that? I would say that Obamacare and the Affordable Care Act has brought uh, Medi-Cal to many more folks than they used to be. I don't really have a percentage, but I know that the number of folks coming to us who are homeless, uh, having Medi-Cal or some kind of insurance coverage has gotten much greater than it used to be. And so certainly the Affordable Care Act has brought medical insurance coverage to many homeless folks who are otherwise not eligible for it previously. Um, I wouldn't say it's 100% at this point, but it's actually, um, I would guess, 65, 70, 75% of homeless folks generally already have Medi-Cal at this point. And when they come to us, if they don't, we usually try to get them qualified for it. I mean, that's one of the basic services I think we offer to everybody at this point in time. I'm not so sure it's translated yet to great care in the substance abuse and mental health issues. Uh, I know there's been some discussion, I know we had a little discussion somewhere yesterday about that there was going to be maybe some use of Medi-Cal and substance abuse treatment, uh, but I think that's still a little bit off at this point in time. Yeah, absolutely. So um, according to our, our 2017 homeless count, which was done in January, the, of the 500, a little, little less than 500 people that we talked to, uh, over 80% told us that they had health insurance, which is extraordinary for that population. So before the Affordable Care Act was implemented, that was definitely not the case because, uh, yeah, so um, about 70% of our, our homeless population is, is single adults or, or couples without children, and uh, many of them were not eligible before. So, so that's a huge step in the right direction. Um, having health insurance does not necessarily mean that the person is accessing care. And so, so there's another step that I think there's a lot of work still to be done on. I know that our providers work very hard to connect people with care when they are having the conversations. Sometimes there's fear around accessing health care um, for whatever reason uh, among folks that haven't been in a while. And sometimes, um, you know, our, our providers are impacted. So there's a, a lot of times there's a long wait for actually seeing a doctor when you need to. Um, and so we're seeing, I think, use of the emergency rooms as a, as a primary point of entry into the a medical care system still a little higher than we would like. Um, and so that's definitely something that we're paying a lot of attention to. Um, but having the ability to have your care paid for was a huge step. With regards to substance use treatment, um, we are um, rolling out the Affordable Care Act happened, and then there was, there was a second thing, I don't know the technical terms, um, but it's a drug Medi-Cal waiver is essentially what we're talking about. Um, California is rolling that out in phases um, across counties. So Yola County is working on a plan right now. Um, we've submitted it. We're working with the, the state on negotiating some of the terms of the plan, and until that's finalized, we can't actually provide the services funded through Medi-Cal. Um, specifically, you know, what we're looking at expanding is residential treatment um, people can access um, outpatient treatment right now so um, that will be a big change but we're not quite there yet maybe in the next year Other questions? Uh, yes uh, I have one I'm Marianne Kirsch I volunteer for the interfaith rotating shelter and I have a question for Chief Patel and I wanted to ask you this this is a specific question Okay, because it happened to me. If you run into a person on the street who is having a mental episode, what should the ordinary citizen do, and how can that person access help for the individual who is undergoing a mental episode at the time? Well, yeah, if you see any kind of behavior that may indicate the person is suffering from uh, some sort of crisis, um, then you can call the police. We go out and, and do an assessment and determine whether they're able to take care of themselves or not based on uh, any mental illness that's present. Um, if they're not, then we can take them into temporary custody and take them to the hospital where they're evaluated by a doctor and potentially placed on a 72-hour hold. If we, we also have an embedded uh, crisis intervention person who specializes in mental health. Uh, she works during the, the daytime, so uh, I think it's Tuesday through Friday now, 
and if she's working, then and assuming that it's not a, a violent uh, situation, then she goes out and does an on-scene assessment to determine whether we need to do the uh, the seventy-two hour hold or not. Um, in many cases, you know, if it's if if it's not really kind of a crisis, then she's able to set up temporary reoccurring appointments to to help the person through what they're going through. Oh, that's good to know. So, should you call the non-emergency number or the emergency number? How yeah, should you? If anybody's that? feeling unsafe, then you can call nine one one. Uh huh. Um, but if not, then call the business number seven four seven fifty four hundred, and that goes to the same dispatch center that just answer the phones in different priority. So seven. Yeah, five three zero, seven four seven fifty four hundred. Okay, that's the right number to call if it's a non-emergency. That's situation. non-emergency. Okay, thank you. Hi, I'm, I'm interested in the housing first model. Um, my name's Marty West. So two questions, one for Rob, what's the timing on getting 30 units built in Davis? And second for Martha, what's the timing on the micro housing options? Right, so the, the, the 30, I think it's actually 36, and Bill might even up that number depending on how he's thinking about it. This is a project that Bill's involved in. So we've entitled 90 total units of one bedroom on Fifth Street, um, out beyond uh, Condittery, out beyond Carlton. There's an empty field there. That's a, it was a, um, a land dedication site from the Mace Ranch days, and and uh, a year and a half ago, council entitled and ga- and, and awarded a project to uh, neighborhood partners and Davis Community Meals to construct and and then administer programs there. Of the 90 units. Uh, my notes are, and, and again, Bill may up it, 36 of those are set aside what we refer to as permanent supportive housing. So some of you may know of the Cesar Chavez Plaza over on Olive Drive. That's a, it's a similar model to the Cesar Chavez, which has 19 of those units. Now, um, so the, uh, we got an update recently. The, the funding uh, from the state, and again, I won't get into the arcania of of state tax credit or federal tax credit funding, but um, the the developers are, are still seeking, I think, about a quarter of a million dollars to round out their funding to to break ground on that project. But we do expect it, um, you know, it, hopefully in the next uh, year to get going. We're probably we're probably two to three years out on actually providing the beds. Uh, we do have, and I don't have the numbers on it. I see some staff here. I'm not sure they do, but we do have the Pacifico. Uh, complex in South Davis, which is going through a renovation, which uh, should pre- be providing some permanent supportive beds as well. Again, I want to distinguish that because the uh, the the all of the units uh, at the Fifth Street, all 90 units, are affordable in perpetuity. They they um, they provide housing for different levels of affordability. The permanent supportive uh, comes with uh, case management. So uh, permanent staff providing case management. Again, in in the terminology, a case manager does not provide all of the services that an individual may need, but the case manager connects that person to all the services. So again, we're probably two to three years out on that. Um, What was not mentioned, I mean, uh, Martha mentioned Pathways to Employment. We we are also working with um, Yolo County Housing as part of the same grant. So the grant that's paying for the uh, Pathways to Employment is also providing uh, getting what we're referring to as getting to zero vouchers. Now, um, just to be clear, uh, most of the most uh, low-income individuals in the county uh, who are in some form of affordable housing uh, are are receiving some form of housing voucher. The problem is the, the waiting lists on these are very very long. As most people know, these are HUD vouchers. Um, and for the most part, and um, so what we're trying to do with the, the money that we've received from Sutter, which is a, a, approximately a quarter of a million dollars over three years, is to provide sort of upfront vouchers to those who are coming through the Pathways program to more quickly move them into a permanent housing situation. But as you can imagine, we still have the challenge of, of finding uh, market rate or affordable units that the vouchers can effectively pay for. So you'd have to match a voucher to an actual living location. Um, I know some of the folks that have moved out of our Pathways program, for example, have not been able to, to match their voucher with housing in Davis, even though Davis is their home. Um, so there's that challenge as well. We are housing them in the county. Um, so that's a little bit, I answered more than you asked, but I think the broader context of how we're taking a sort of a multi-pronged approach 
Um, that's why I said out of the gate, housing first as a model is, is a great model. Housing first as a practice in Yolo County and in California right now is a, is a big challenge because of the, simply the lack of affordable housing stock that's there to put people into and vacancy. We're at two tenths of 1% in our rental market and Woodland and, and West Sacramento are not far behind. And I, I'll, I'll just use this as an opportunity to make one little statement. You know, that HUD funding uh, is at risk today. <laughs> so, you know, whether it's, you know, the money that we're giving to Davis Community Mills for some of the transitional housing, for the Resource Center, um, that's CDBG money or, or other housing voucher money, it, it, at least the budget that was presented by the president uh, is to cut uh, most or all, cut all the CDBG and cut a large chunk of the, of the vouchers. So we're in an environment where I, I don't think that's going to happen. It could happen, and then there's going to be a question of how, as a community, we uh, pick up the slack. Um, right now, we're in the visioning stage with the city on this because uh, we're looking at funding partners that need to go through the city. Um, so depending on how that goes, one of the hopes is if we can get a design for the microhousing that it might go up more quickly than uh, than other housing and the, the price tag might not be as high. But again, as, as Rob mentioned, we are focusing right now on permanent supportive, so we also will need a, a revenue stream for continuing programs. And how that we can creatively come up with that is a very big issue. If I could just follow up Rob's comments about Creekside. You know, Creekside is 90 units of affordable housing. 44 of those units are going to be set aside for what's called extremely low income folks, which mainly are going to be homeless or at risk of homeless folks with what's called a special need, somebody with major mental health problems, substance abuse issue, uh, physical disability, or some combination thereof. And the great thing about extremely low income housing is that for the folks who are just SSI recipients, if they were getting $800, $850 a month, the rent there for one of the units is going to be in the neighborhood of 250 to $300 for the unit, which is probably a third of what it is or a fourth of most of the one-bedroom units already existing in Davis. And we already do the same model over at Cesar Chavez Plaza, which we had up and running for almost 10 years now. And that, was, that program was set up to have 19 units of special needs housing at extremely low income rates. And currently, because of a variety of different things with... Uh, housing choice vouchers and program-based vouchers. We currently have about 43 special needs folks living there also. And so, I mean, the model is- What's your waiting is, list there, Bob? Or, and uh, the Bill. waiting list goes on for two to three years, unfortunately. And so, I mean, if you go in there and put an application now, you're probably not gonna get your name called at least for another year and a half, maybe two years. And Creekside is supposed to, was originally scheduled to open in 2019. With the groundbreaking this year, I'm not sure we're on that schedule at this point, but if we are off, it's not going to be much much different than that, I don't think. Maybe you should use the mic so that... I think it's right. Somebody else has. Okay. The amount of money that you need for these projects is so large that in terms of community support seems so small that we would raise. Is it a, a place where the community would feel that it make a difference? Because otherwise you need a much larger stream. Do you know what I'm saying? Uh, as individuals Are you talking in the about community. A, a stream for maintenance or for building? For anything. Okay. Uh, would the small amounts of money help or is it that it takes so much that it's a drop in the bucket? So I, I, I'd like to address that just, I mean, I don't have a dollar figure that I'm sitting on, but I think we need to look in terms of relative, ma relative magnitude. So we have a quarter of a million dollars over three years that we believe is going to help get the ball rolling. I would say that's probably a quarter of what we need um, if we're really going to address longer term. Uh, let's say it's half. Let me just make a comparison, just so that we get the relative magnitude of how we generate resources. So currently in the city, you have on your tax bill a $25 a year 
open space tax. Um, staff estimates that that generates approximately $700,000 a year. So each of you in your home paying $25 flat fee generates 700000 That's already almost three times as much as we have from Sutter, uh, and that's over three years. So that's per year. You also pay a $50 a year parks tax, um, which is coming up for renewal next year, by the way. That $50 parks tax generates $1.4 million a year to the city for parks. And then, m most of you may have forgotten this, you also pay a $100 a year library tax. Um, that generates $2.8 million a year. Now these are things that we as a community have decided we want to tax ourselves for. No city council has imposed them. No city council has said you must pay that. Every vote of this nature, and I think all of these, if I'm not mis mistaken, were special taxes. Me they are special taxes, meaning that two-thirds majority had to pass them. So I guess an open question is, I mean, two I think if you look down the row here and tell the folks sitting around the table here or the county that we could generate $2.8 million for programs related to social services, I think you would see them saying, we can do a lot with that. Um, so we need to have a conversation about how we think about revenue. Um, we are willing to tax ourselves. We tax ourselves for schools at much larger rates than even those. Um, will we decide that it's time to uh, make a small contribution uh, for the purposes of dealing with some of the social challenges that we've outlined. Okay, before the next question, I just want to thank Davis Media Access for being here. They've been great partners to the chamber. They are filming this forum and we'll have it available up on our website and we'll share it with the city and other partners. So I just wanted to keep you informed. I could just comment on that one more little bit. I think that there also is diversity of help that's needed. So uh, in some case, it's a need for land, a, you know, like a half an acre of land. Um, and in other cases, it might be services that uh, community could provide. I mean, professional services is one thing, uh, but also there are support services. And uh, we're starting uh, a wellness center is coming to Davis for mental health clients. And there's peer, uh, um, peer counseling there. So getting trained to be a peer counselor at a wellness center might be uh, an opportunity. So there are opportunities for uh, service that the community can give as well as financial. Oh, then I guess gotta, sorry, I know you wanna make a comment, sir, but um, so let's talk about that in-kind kind of giving. Um, so case management, um, and I don't think we've done enough of this in the community. So I think Tracy could speak to the example of the Bridge to Housing program in, in West Sacramento, which I think arguably has been very successful. I think the success, the, the success of programs going forward for populations that have special needs is really gonna rely, uh, we talk about the wraparound services or the per permanent supportive services. Um, some of that is specific services, right? Some of that is specific mental health services or counseling services. Um, but there's a large piece of this that I think, um, because there's members of the community that have been involved for so many years in things like the Interfaith Rotating Winter Shelter, or volunteering at Davis Community Meals, that we have a kind of a uniquely equipped population to do another piece of this um, uh, case management, which is, you might call it, some communities they call it advocates, or some communities call it mentors. Some communities um, just call it people that come alongside other people. And that is the relational piece of willingly walking with someone who's moving out of a situation of maybe addiction, homelessness, living with their mental health challenges, living with their addiction, to be in relationship, um, to be there to say, you know, are you going to your doctor's appointment? Are you maintaining your regimen? How are things going? That's really important work. And I think we, uh, we often look at the, you know, sort of the nonprofit or the state bureaucracy as the, you know, sort of the experts in managing the situation. But I don't think we should underestimate the importance of the model, which I know organizations like Grace in Action have and Davis Community Meals to a certain extent, of relational being with people. Um, Bill said to me one time, and I'll never forget it, um, and I quote him oftentimes, you know, we need to be in relationship with people because every once in a while there's a moment of lucidity. 
And people in that moment of lucidity are ready to make a change. And, and I've seen this. I can give you a couple of cases when I was working in, it, with Bill and with his organization and others where people came to us and said, I am going to die if I don't get out of this. And at that moment, if someone's in relationship with them, um, then there's an opportunity for a change. And in some cases, that change was, we can send you home to your family. In some cases, that was, we can get you into an alcohol rehab program. Um, and so I would appeal also as we go forward that we think about giving in terms of the time, and we need mature people who can take rejection. Because a lot of the relational is about walking for weeks and weeks with people who will tell you, I love you, I love you, I love you, and then tomorrow it's F you, get out of my face. And we need to be committed to the relationship. Um, and if we do that, then we have a possibility of moving beyond just to talk about financial resources to recognizing that the greatest resource we have as a community is the relational potential we have with the citizens of this community. So I, before I get off council, I, I really would like to see a mentoring program established around all of the services that we as a city are starting to roll out because I think there's uh, real importance in going that direction as well. Uh, my name's Alan Goulding. And I first just wanted to say uh, I'm very impressed with the compassion shown by many of the people in this room. But, Mr. Mayor, are you creating a magnet for homeless? Uh, you are, I believe, a little naive in thinking that 90 units is going to solve the problem. What it's going to do is attract 300 more homeless. If you speak with the police officers on the street, they will say anecdotally, off the record, that Davis has become known along the West Coast as a place to come if you're homeless. How are you going to stop us becoming a magnet for homeless, not, on the, not only in California, but the West Coast? I think you be, need to be working on tools to control that give the police more power, and certainly you do not have my approval to spend my tax dollars on some of the things you're talking about. Great, so I'll respond to a few of those things. Um, you'll have a vote if I ever come, if my colleagues ever come to, to request uh, taxing uh, uh, ability, you'll have a vote. So rest assured, Rob Davis is not gonna jam anything down anybody's throat. Um, second, I'll let Darren speak to what the police are seeing. Second, um, I didn't claim, nor would I claim, that building 90 units on 5th Street is going to solve the problem. So let me just put that to rest. I, I'm not making that claim. In fact, I'll say, building 90 units on 5th Street will not solve the problem. Right, we have an intractable problem. I named it. It's a syndrome of addiction, mental health, and trauma. Building a structure will not solve that problem. I, I want to be absolutely clear with you on that. I don't believe that. I'm not that naive. My field is public health. I understand how difficult it is to deal with syndromes. Um, so I'm with you. Um, third, um, I've been to the League of California Cities conference twice <coughs> since I've been on city council. I've been to the sessions that are held at those meetings, which is mayors and city council members and city managers from across the state. I've been to the sessions that are about homelessness and how we're dealing with it. Um, when I talked to my colleagues, mayors, mayor pro tems, they said what our, what our population is most concerned about is that we're a magnet for homelessness. If you talk to the mayor of Woodland, he will tell you, my population is concerned that we're a magnet for homelessness. If you talk to the mayor of West Sacramento, Sacramento, um, every mayor in the state is hearing the same thing from the population. Um, there is absolutely no evidence that that's the case. Davis has the lowest per capita homeless population of the three major cities in Yolo County, uh, by a long shot less than West Sacramento, and almost on par with Woodland. Um, to me, uh, when I look at the per capita um, um, statistics from around the state, Davis is one of the lower per capita homeless populations in the state. Um, so I don't see evidence for what you're saying, and that's why I'm not, I'm not concerned about that issue. 
I'm concerned about many issues, but I'm not concerned that we're creating a magnet because the data just isn't there. And I'm hearing from all of my colleagues across the state that this is a concern of every population. So what, what is happening is that we are seeing an increase in homelessness across the state. We are seeing an increase in homelessness in our community. We are seeing an increase in chronic homelessness across the state. We are seeing an increase in chronic homelessness in our community. That is real. On a per capita basis, it is going up. And on an absolute numbers basis, it is going up. Do I understand what's happening? Not completely. Um, I do understand that the state of California has um, underfunded and has basically um, taken away resources from cities that were promised to cities to deal with mental health. We have a generation of unfunding, defunding, not funding mental health. Somewhere along the line that catches up with us. Um, the other thing I've seen, which in my 25 years in public health that I've mentioned, I have never seen anything as devastating as methamphetamines. I have never seen anything as devastating. I have never, I'd rather work with malaria in West Africa than work with methamphetamines in my community. It is the most addictive substance that I've ever seen and we are in the middle of it. And so I, I, I get it. You, you don't wanna spend the money. I'm not gonna force you to. I don't agree with you obviously that we have a magnet problem. I do agree that we have a growing problem. And I do believe that that growing problem is a problem of untreated addiction, untreated mental health challenges, and um, we have choices to make as a community. If, 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 if it's the community's desire that we defund and not deal with it, um, I don't think that that will make the problem go away. And that's my personal conviction. Um, and and I really do understand that people disagree with me pretty, pretty forcefully on that. I'm but. going to follow up to that, Rob, real quick. Is, is whether or not that's actually true based on the numbers, it is a perception. We hear it all the time as well from the chamber, is that we're a magnet. Davis is a very generous community, and the homeless have realized that they can get all, of, all the things that they need. Now, I don't know if that's true or not, but it is a perception. So, Darren, I would love to hear your feedback on that. Yeah, so, um, you know, we've been saying that Davis is a magnet for homeless for at least 25 years. Uh, when I was back on patrol, we said the same thing. So that statement is nothing new, and, it, and it's not a secret. Um, we publicly say it at meetings that it, we have a homeless issue, but we've had a homeless issue for a really long time. Um, just as the, the mayor said that he goes to the conferences and listens to other mayors talking about homeless, two weeks ago I went to the California Police Chiefs Association annual conference, and one of the main sessions for all of the chiefs in the state was to talk about homeless issues and what it is that they're doing to try to deal with the problem. And uh, I heard from chiefs from the north to the south, from the big to the small, saying that the number one issue that they're facing in their community is homelessness and how they, the police officers can deal with the situation. So uh, this is nothing that's, that's different with every other community in, in California. Um, the, the sad part was I listened to uh, chiefs from all over the state talk about what they're doing and uh, in many cases we're actually doing a little bit more to try to deal with, with some of our, our local issues. And I heard nothing innovative whatsoever from any of the chiefs across the state to try to address this problem. Uh, if, we, if we actually do uh, the, the homeless team, outreach team that uh, I proposed, uh, that would be really unique. Uh, nobody else is, is doing social workers within police departments to help deal with the problem. So, um, it is, as far as all of the services that we're offering, it is. I think it is true that Davis is a, a very generous community, um, but we've been talking about that for many, many years. We had, and and it, the problem is a little bit more difficult than that. And at the police department, we really take a look at two different types of homeless. The the first is um, those who are chronically homeless and really suffering from some sort of mental illness, addiction, um, something you know childhood trauma, something that they're not able to get their life back together and um, you know, be part of a, a regular community. But we also have transients, and those are the homeless population where we, they're, they're making a choice. 
And in many cases, homelessness is kind of a lifestyle. For, I see a lot of gray-haired people. Back in the 70s, you used to see a lot of people at, at on-ramps uh, who were hitchhiking. And they were going community to community and just experiencing life in a different way than those who decided to you know, make a home somewhere. Well, we don't see hitchhikers anymore. But we're seeing the same type of behavior in the communities that we have seen forever, which is they're just uh, jumping on the train or taking a bus and going from community to community, experiencing what there is to offer, uh, and then moving on. So as we talk about the, the chronic homeless numbers in Davis, we see it as kind of cyclical. We see uh, there's, there's times where we have a lot more and times that we have a lot less. As far as problems that we're facing with the population, there are definitely times that we deal with and respond to a lot more calls, and there's other times of you know relative peace. So it, it, I think it's just one of those things that's been here a long time. Uh, I think what you're hearing from the panel is there's no easy answer. Uh, from the police department perspective, we are an absolute supporter of the families or the, um, the homes first model uh, and housing first until we get people in houses you know, uh, we're just putting band-aids every time we go out in the field and try to deal with addiction or mental health uh, until we get people in a place where they're regularly receiving ongoing uh, treatment for whatever the issue is, uh, we're probably not going to uh, eliminate their status as, as being homeless. So those are really important programs, um, and, and I think we have to focus on that population Quite honestly, I think most of you are really complaining about the more transient population, which is a little bit different. Now on that, uh, the voters of the state of California have changed the laws very significantly in the past six years. Things that used to be illegal are no longer illegal. Uh, behavior that used to land somebody in jail or prison, it's no longer doing that. Uh, drug offenses, we arrest a person, they're out of jail in two hours. No matter how many times you're caught in possession of drugs, it's still a misdemeanor and there is essentially no punishment. So, and really no incentive to get treatment. That was through a California proposition. So, you know, uh, crimes that used to be state prison felonies, now they're county jail felonies and in most cases misdemeanors. We, we changed the classification of many crimes uh, back to misdemeanors. So. Again, uh, you know, people keep saying, you know, can't you lock these people up? And the answer is no. We have to find a different way to deal with people. And you know, from the, the police perspective, uh, since nobody is going to jail, the, the real answers are in providing social services. I, I did. I, I just wanted to follow up on the gentleman's question about how many homeless are in Davis. You know, back earlier this year, we did a homeless census, and we counted on January 23rd, 146 homeless people. They were either living in the streets, living in shelters, living at the IWS, living at Empower YOLO, or living at a CalWorks program that was existing, I think, at Motel 6 in South Davis. Uh, compared to the rest of the county, that meant we had 21 homeless individuals that night in Davis per 10,000 of population in Davis. That compares to West Sacramento, which on that night had 37 homeless people per 10,000 population and 197 homeless individuals that night. Uh, I would just make a comment that throughout the year, I know our records show that we usually serve between 400 to 450 different homeless individuals throughout the year because many folks only come here, only here for a short period of time, a couple of days. They stop by my resource center to get some help and they move on. You know, a whole range of reasons why they're only in Davis for a very short term. Certainly there are about, I would estimate, 50 to 70 chronically homeless people in Davis who have been here sometimes for 10, 15, 20 years. And they've been persistent, unwilling to change, and certainly presented some of the more major mental health and substance abuse issues that we've ever wanted to deal with. I would certainly add one other thing to, I think, what Rob mentioned about methamphetamine use because I know, I'm sure you've seen the news, but heroin's actually become a pretty big drug issue among the homeless population also, uh, which of course is not good news. Um, and that's a very intractable problem, which has some very uh, serious and detrimental life effects on somebody who becomes a heroin addict, either when they're using or even after they've kicked their addiction. Um, and I would just kind of make a few comments about, you know, I know there's been some discussion about 
how mobile homeless people become, how they seem to be moving around. And frankly, that's a function of a couple of different things. I think the major one is just a total lack of housing pretty much throughout California at this point in time. I mean, we're hearing stories of San Francisco agencies placing homeless folks in Dixon, uh, trying to put them, put them in applications for housing in Sacramento because it just doesn't exist the affordable housing in the San Francisco and the Bay Area to house the folks there. And we're seeing the effects of that because they're moving around more regularly because the housing does not exist. And in Davis, with a 0.02 vacancy rate, and Woodland and West Sacramento, probably just in the single digits at 4 5 or 6%, there just is not the affordable housing out there to do much of anything with many folks, whether they have vouchers or not, because many times vouchers won't pay the rent because the rent is too expensive for the voucher to afford. And that's become a serious issue, deterring us really from implementing first the Housing First model in a very successful way, because the Housing First model depends upon having cheap, affordable housing you can place folks into with a voucher or not with a voucher, and it does not exist. And we're spending a lot of time in the county doing what's called coordinate entry and other types of issues to kind of further folks with the more serious and more vulnerable issues moving into housing first. But the big roadblock is that the housing doesn't exist to make that happen. And until that's fixed, I mean, more social services, more social workers on the street, that all sounds good. But the plain matter of fact is that without the housing to fo support these people and put them in, they're going to remain homeless. And that's, that's just the bottom line. I mean, we've been working on housing issues around the county for many years, and frankly, I mean, Creekside's gonna bring in 90 units of housing. It's certainly gonna solve the issue for about 44 people, maybe more. But the plain fact of the matter is those 44 people are gonna move in there, and I'm gonna get, guess within six months, if they're all from Davis, there's gonna be 44 new homeless people back in Davis, backfilling where they've been. Mm -hmm. Can we circle back? We're gonna go ahead and sure. I think I have a question, yeah, a question that might be something everyone here is also just as interested in, and that's what Darren was mentioning, that we have, a, we have a completely different problem than homelessness that a lot of us encounter, especially downtown, um, in the parking lots when um, people are asking for money on the curb. Um, they are choosing a lifestyle and some of them, I'm not saying all of them, I'm saying some of them have made this a career for themselves, a lifestyle for whatever reason, and don't accept the help that we have to offer. They don't accept the, the services. How do, you, how do you motivate them to then finally say, yes, I want the help? Maybe by not handing them money that they spend on drugs and alcohol. Maybe by handing them a business card a business card that you can pick up from any local uh, small business, any grocery store in Davis that lists all of the services, mental health, um, food, temporary shelter, all the stuff that we all say we want to provide for them. But don't give them the cash that doesn't always get spent on food. It gets spent on drugs and alcohol that continue to keep them in the cycle that they're in where they're not asking for help because they're not clear-headed enough to know that they need help. Bus business cards. Can we, can we as a community donate money? Uh, my business would be happy to fund 10,000 business cards to put throughout the city if the community could agree that handing them a business card to offer those services is a good way to go. And can I just add, we talked, the city has talked about a little bit about giving meters or some other programs like that. And I'm sure each of you can touch on that a little bit. Yeah, I, well, let me just, you know, I, it's a controversial issue. When people ask me my opinion about giving uh, people on the street who are requesting money money, I tell them I don't think it's a good idea. And I, I don't think it's a good idea because I think um, it would be better to sort of dig down into what the need is and then, you know, figure out ways to meet it. Um, it it's true. I think a lot of folks, um, you know, do use the resources for um, dealing with, with an addiction. Um, I see that. So 
I think alternatives, um, but, but we're talking about a large population of people in the city who make their own individual choices about whether to give or not, and their reasons for giving are their very own personal reasons. If I'm asked, and I'll say here, I think it's a bad idea. I think it's a bad idea because I think there are, if people are hungry, we can feed them. If people are in a, are in a crisis situation, we can get them into uh, you know, a crisis intervention way. If people are without housing, we've heard, that's a challenge. Um, but we can at least seek out, and we do that. I, I run into people a lot downtown who I help get to Woodland if we don't have beds here, or get into, help the person get into a, a crisis bed who was fleeing domestic abuse. We, have the, we can help people in that way, but I think folks that are, um, that are um, you know, again, deep within an addiction, looking for money, I don't think it's a good idea to give. P people disagree with me on that, but I don't think it's a good idea to give, and I would rather um, that we put resources into strengthening the types of services that are currently lacking. Whatever, whatever method we come up with, whether it's sort of a giving meter or whether we use a, a system of cards, I, I think the, the, I think it would be useful to say, you know, to, for, to help people to have a more nuanced understanding that simply giving is not necessarily the best response to what's in front of you. Um, I think a much more appropriate response is to, is to, and we don't do this, of course, but is to try to understand exactly what need is being presented in front of you. That takes more time and it's much more difficult. He kind of said what I was going to say. Um, so yeah, uh, this is one of the most controversial issues in this community when it comes to homeless. Uh, for every person that says never give anybody any money and, and don't provide services, there's other people with the complete opposite view. Uh, at, at the police department, we always hear the complete opposite views. For for every time somebody's reporting a homeless camp and I want it out of here right now, uh, there's three people emailing going, they're not doing anything wrong. Uh, and kind of providing money downtown panhandling is the same way. Uh, I do have thoughts on it. Uh, you know, providing money that's going to uh, drugs, alcohol, and tobacco is never a good idea. Uh, and that's commonly what is happening when panhandlers get money. We're seeing a lot more drug abuse in the population than we ever have before. So Bill mentioned uh, heroin. And it's cheap. Heroin is really cheap but meth is even worse. So when I first started in law enforcement back in the 80s, uh, that was still during the, the old heroin crisis. But by the early 90s, meth appeared, and uh, nobody really did heroin. And then suddenly, about two, three years ago, we started seeing heroin use again. In fact, we had many heroin-related uh, overdose deaths occurring here in Davis. Well, now heroin, the, the price has dropped significantly, but the price of meth has dropped even more significantly. Five years ago, an ounce of meth, uh, we were talking about $500, uh, 340 to 500 depending on how much cut was in it. Now, an ounce of meth is 60 bucks. That's 340 doses of methamphetamine. So, uh, you know, going out and panhandling for an afternoon, uh, most of the panhandlers are telling us they receive somewhere between 60 and $180 per day. And essentially what they're doing is, is turning that into drugs. Uh, so we're going out and uh, in actually all of the homeless camps, really, uh, we're finding hypodermic needles, which is usually either meth or heroin. Um, that's a very common now. So most of the camp cleanups we do are kind of hazardous material uh, areas. Uh, we're seeing more and more needles show up into the parks when we're arresting people for being drunk in public or the influence of drugs. Uh, they have money in their pockets and drugs in their pocket. Um, and again, um, that's a, this is a really difficult difficult issue because they're only going to jail for a very temporary period of time and not actually seeking help. On, on the issue of um, how is it that we get people help? Well, I hate to say it, but it really is about relationship building. And, and that's why you know, I'm really supportive of, of uh, the kind of the social, ser social service aspect and building relationships with the community. We also uh, see the exact same thing that the mayor was talking about you get these fleeting moments of somebody who says, I'm about to die or I just need help. And the worst response that we can give is, uh, I got nothing right now, but we can get you on a waiting list. And that is just absolutely devastating and, and it's a lost opportunity. 
but the more that we're able to build relationships with the, the population, the more likely that we are able to align services. And I think we do have to start improving many of the services that, that um, are either no longer offered or should be offered. We have time for maybe one or two more questions. Yeah. Mm -hmm. A uh, quick comment with the pathways to employment, we're hoping that uh, to set up giving majors specifically to support the program so it gives an alternative. So um, I have a couple of things to ask or to say. I appreciate the part about developing relationships with the homeless. I believe every human has value and deserves dignity. But last week I received this long email from a neighbor. It was sent to our whole entire um, neighborhood um, about all of the camps that are across the street from our houses, including camps that are setting up at the church that's also on our street. And the family's not comfortable. They have two young children. They're fearful of being out and about because there are people that are scary to them. And I wouldn't just say it's because they're bad people and they don't want to interact with them, but they're fearful for their children. And to tell you the truth, I've worked with your code compliance folks before, and you know, I feel like we must know each other or something, because there's always something going on. Um, but I don't ever see a response from the police, and I'm told, well, we have to wait for two weeks of no rain, and then we can go clean up the camps. But they've been there for months, and then they leave, and then they come back. And it's been like that for several years. And they're back, and they've been for, there for several months. And I know everyone needs a home, but the litter and the trash and the shopping carts and everything, it's just, it's building up. And it makes, it makes our environment look unfriendly and undesirable. So what, what are we supposed to do? I want to be kind to everyone. I can tell you one of those guys, clearly has mental health issues because he walks into the church parking lot and he dazes for hours. But nothing, nobody responds to it. I saw a man urinating in public this morning. I called your non-emergency line. Nobody addressed it. And I'm told um, that by the business that I was visiting, oh, this happens all the time. We're so sorry. I said, well, it's not for you to apologize for. So it's just, it's like, what do we do? Yeah, the, the issue of camp cleanups um, and dealing with some of the situations timely is very difficult. The, the first part is uh, the constitutional considerations on how we go about displacing people. So really, the cycle that we're in right now is displacement, cleanup, displacement, cleanup. Uh, and it's a never-ending cycle. And, and that's part of the reason why you're hearing that Housing First is such an important model. So right now, uh, somebody calls in and, and says, hey, there's an illegal camp somewhere. People are living there, and it's dirty, unsightly, a nuisance. We have to go out and make contact and determine what's going on. The first thing that we try to do is align services for the person and see if they're eligible for any type of relief. In some cases, they are. So if there's something, you know, an emergency situation, domestic violence or something like that, then we can get them into at least some shelter. Um, if not, then they go on lists for uh, other services. We work uh, with Davis Community Meals, who go out and, uh, goes out and does first contact with a lot of the, the camps and see if they can align services or not. And then after usually a week, we go out and start the process of um, eviction, for a lack of a, a better word. Um, and then from there, uh, there's due process requirements for how long the person is noticed, giving an opportunity to leave, giving an opportunity to clean up, um, and then where are they going to go? So, and I can give you a real life example. Right now we're dealing with, uh, well, we will be on the 15th, dealing with a massive cleanup along F Street, which many people are complaining about. And we're also dealing with a pretty massive cleanup over along the 113 near Sycamore. We already know what's gonna happen. The F Street people are going to be relocated or dislocated, and they're heading to Sycamore, and the Sycamore people are going to F Street. Mm -hmm. So it's this, ne it, this is this never ending cycle that we're in. Uh, pretty much the camps are located in areas that are um, still in sight at times, but not, uh, not really on the beaten path as much, and 
that is that's really the cycle until we were able to find some housing. The as far as laws, you know, dealing with uh, infractions such as you know urination in public and things like that, those are really difficult and challenging in dealing with the homeless population. It's kind of unfair. Uh, one of the things that I see for most of you in the room is, I'm I'm guessing by the, the way that you're dressed and appear that you have money. You know, when you don't have any money, uh, you're not going to pay criminal fines. And so even if we cite you, uh, that doesn't necessarily mean anything. Uh, yep, you may go to court, judge may impose a fine, but you're not going to pay it. We have some individuals that have 10 or 15 warrants uh, for them for not taking care of you know previous fines. That, that also can potentially lead to other problems, uh, and we're starting to experience this now as well. In some cases where we have done uh, unification, which is helping somebody go somewhere else to hopefully be with family or somebody that can help them, uh, because they have warrants, some cop in some other city, or county, state, arrest the person on our warrants, and guess what? They have to come back here to Yellow County. And then we're right back in the same cycle that we were before. So we're also very cognizant of that as well. So it is difficult. Um, I did ask for some budget ads this year. Right now, believe it or not, there is no city department that's specifically charged with camp cleanups. The police department, because we have code enforcement, we kind of took it by default several years ago, but without adding any real staff money resources to do it. Um, but we've been just figuring it out, um, sometimes begging other, other departments to you know, help out for a day so that we can do something. We've pr primarily been using uh, the probationers, so the Yellow County Probation Department, to come and do the camp cleanups. That's also had some challenges because uh, right now some of the, the camps are hazmat sites because of needles and um, all of the, the human waste. So we've run into some issues with that. Um, but I hear that I may get a budget ad this year. Yes, okay. So I now I've officially heard it. I'm getting money this year so that we can actually hire people specifically to come in and clean up camps on a much more timely basis. And I think that will be a really big help. I'm also asking for another code enforcement officer. I just didn't, I didn't get the wave on that one. So <laughs> we'll, we'll see if that happens and which would also speed up the, the process. Yeah, we haven't actually voted on the budget yet, Darren. So, uh, <clears throat> um, I, no, but I, so we talk, city manager, Darren and I, Joan Planell, um, we talk about this weekly. We, uh, I'll just say it, I, I don't know what to do. I, I don't know what to do. Um, I've been talking to the district attorney, uh, Chris Balkley, who's been running the neighborhood court program here in town. We think an opportunity, he's, he's experimenting in West Sacramento with a neighborhood court approach for homeless individuals. Um, I think he'd like to expand it here. Now, neighborhood court is a restorative process. The value, I think, for a situation like this is that we can train people who will sit on panels with folks who are being arrested for certain behaviors, and we can talk to them more directly about the harms that this causes the community. I think, first of all, there's very little relationship between a lot of homeless individuals and others in the community. It's, there is no relationship. And so neighborhood court does hold out the possibility of allowing community members who are trained to sit with folks and say, this does cause harm to us. This does scare us. This is what happens when you engage in this behavior. The principle of restorative justice then is that the person takes responsibility for their action and there's a plan put in place to try to avoid it in the future. Um, if you talk to Chris Balkley, and I recommend that you do about this, because Chris um, has been a real innovator in using neighborhood court for other low-level crimes related to public drunkenness and other that mostly affect younger people in the community. He's a strong advocate for it. I think we've benefited from it. But when we're dealing with, uh, with more entitled populations around public drunkenness, uh, for example, or, or low-level crimes, the, there are resources available. There are things that they can do to make the harm right. I mean, when we're dealing with folks who are camping and creating a lot of um, hazardous situations, um, part of making things right is, 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 is starting to move in the direction of a lifestyle change. And as I think you've heard from all of us, 
services need to be available to enable that. So one of the things that Chris, when he started doing neighborhood court for homeless people in West Sacramento, he called me up. I mean, this is a DA. Uh, he called me up and said, Rob, there aren't any services for homeless people. I mean, they're coming into our program, and we have these things that we're asking them to do, and then there's no place to take them. And so it's kind of nice when the DA becomes an advocate for, you know, mental health and other services, but I think that's exactly what happens through a restorative process, is that people begin to realize that we have a systemic problem and that we need to deal with it systemically. And I just want to say what I said to you. This is the most intractable problem that we have. And, and I don't know what to say except to ask for patience as we, as we try to put into place structures and systems that enable us to move more people out of those situations and provide them with the services they need. And okay. it is a long-term project. We're just nearing 1 o'clock, so we're, we're out of time. And if you'd like to remain, if anybody can stay for a few minutes, that would be great. But in the last minute, if each of you, one sentence... What do you think the solution in your mind will be for this particular problem? If you can do it in one sentence, I know it's a huge problem. What do you think? I would ask us to be patient and to be willing to engage in a relational approach to solving this problem. You did it again to me. <laughs> Yeah, I was, I was going to say the same thing. Be patient. Uh, you know, we get a lot of phone calls, complaints, uh, but we're, we're really trying to operate both within the law and trying to do best for the, the people that we're working with. So be patient. It does take time, and I know that that causes frustration, but uh, we really do ask for patience. I will uh, third that patience and relationships, I think they're critical, and also um, the, the solution is housing. So... That's what we need to continue to work on. Yeah, uh, make way for innovative housing that is below perhaps the usual limits that are uh, allowed and uh, develop compassion. I'd encourage everybody to go to acesconnection.com and learn about adverse childhood experiences and what happens, how addiction feeds uh, trauma, childhood trauma, and how to get out of the cycle. I, I would say patience, relationships, and I'd go home and write on a chalkboard a thousand times affordable housing. Great. That, that, that is the main issue. Well, thank you, all of you, for coming today. We hope to continue this dialogue. I think we all can agree that it's going to take all of us working together to come up with a solution. Obviously, housing and funding is going to be a critical need. Um, I had a comment made that um, perhaps if the city is interested in people who want to mentor or be a part of the solution, how would they get engaged? That's me. I, mean, I don't think we have a program yet. Um, and I think that's, you heard me say, that's one of the things that I'd like to see develop before I, I leave office next year. All right. Maybe they could be involved in the conversation about mentorship. Let's get in touch with Rob. Yeah. Sure. Yeah.